Good evening. My pleasure to welcome everyone here to the Bremen Church of Christ for our evening worship. Certainly a special evening for us with all of these visitors here. We're hosting the area-wide devotional in uh, the area and anyone else who wants to come devotional after the services this evening. And uh, certainly have a lot of our friends from Camp Negehi here and we're very excited about that. This evening we have a special treat for you. We're having two of our young, well, all of the young men, some of the young men from our congregation will be helping with the uh, presentation of our worship this evening. And um, I am going to get Chris Stevenson to come up here and give you the order of worship because he knows who all of those people are and tell you a little bit more about that. I'd like to add my welcome as well to all that are here. We're certainly thankful for each one that have made the trip out. Some have traveled great distances to be here, and we're so excited for you to be here, and we're thankful and we're sure that it'll be worth the trip. Tonight we are pleased to have our young men conduct the evening worship service. Brother Johnny, I guess, can still be considered somewhat of a young man, so he will be leading our song service at the appropriate time, Brother Todd Spake. Uh, Mr. Camp Inigahi for that week, as I recall, will also lead our opening prayer. And then uh, <clears throat> Brother Scott Lloyd will have a lesson for us, and we'll have another song. And then um, Brother Thad Williams will lead a prayer. Thad Le Williams will lead a prayer. And then after that, Brother Tate Williams will present a lesson to us and extend the invitation at that time. After some housekeeping, some announcements, and uh, so forth, then Brother Jake Rees will dismiss us in prayer at the conclusion of our service. So let's uh, join heartily in our song service. 482. 482. Sing and be happy. Let's stand for our first song this evening. <clears throat> If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray, although they blue, there's a silver light that will shine in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, trust in his promises. Seated, please. 
672. 672. We'll just sing verses 1 and 4. 1 and 4. Our God, he is alive. There is beyond the azure blue our God and still from human side. It is God heavenly hue and bring the world with his great might. There is a God sing the greatest commands, which will be on the screen above my head. Greatest commands. <laughs> love one another, for love is of God. He Let us pray. 
Thank you, God, for this day. And thank you for the camp in Agahee and all the good that is done there. Thank you for all the men and women who volunteer their time and effort to making it such a great place. And dear Lord, please be with the sick and help them to get better. And thank you for all that you do for us. And please be with us in all the days of our life. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As was mentioned earlier, we are having the young men conduct parts of the worship service and one not so young man. Uh, but our first speaker, we're certainly thankful to have him here at Bremen and uh, has become an uh, integral part of our youth group and our congregation here, Scott Lloyd. Good evening. Before I begin, I would like to take this time to thank the elders for granting me this opportunity to speak before you. Masks. Masks have been used throughout the ages within multiple cultures dating back thousands of years. The Egyptians and the Nubians are among the most famous civilizations of the ancient times for their use of masks. However, it was the ancient Greeks who perfected the craft of making and using masks. Masks originally were used in theater. Even if a play had a limited cast of performers, there was virtually no limit to the amount of characters that could potentially be used in a play. Actors could change their emotions and even who they were by simply putting on a mask. When I think of masks in today's context, I think of superheroes. They wear intricate masks that cover their face and thus protect their secret identities. They do this to protect their real selves, their families, and their friends. For example, Spider-Man. Peter Parker wears a mask that covers his entire face and thus keeping his identity secret. Peter Parker wears this mask so that when he is in Spider-Man, his en enemies, the Green Goblin, Doc Ock, Carnage, and Arachne, to name a few, do not go after those that are closest to him, such as Mary Jane Watson and his Aunt May. People wear masks to protect what is on the inside from being discovered. Masks depict something different on the outside so that people don't know what really is on the other side of the mask. And that is the point of my lesson this evening. Many people today wear masks, not literally, but symbolically regarding their spiritual life. On Sundays and Wednesdays, they wear masks, depicting themselves as good, godly people. And yet, when it's time to return home, they take off the mask and expose their true selves. One of the best examples of a mask in the Old Testament is the account of David and Bathsheba. In general, David was a great man of God. The scriptures even tell us that David was a man after God's own heart. Yet, like every man, David sinned. For fear that someone might find out about this sin, David tried to mask it from others. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 11. Starting in verse 2, Again, that's the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 11, starting in verse 2. And it reads, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. David knew that Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, yet that didn't stop him from sinning with her. When David found out that Bathsheba was pregnant with his child, he immediately began to scheme trying to find a way to cover it up. David sends for Uriah from the battlefield in hopes that he will stay at home long enough to think that Bathsheba is pregnant with his child. Well, that didn't work. 2 Samuel 11.9 tells us that Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went down, not into the house. David begins to scheme for plan B, so to speak. For those of you who are familiar with the story that involves Uriah being killed on the battlefield, if you skip down to verse 14 of chapter 11, it reads, 
In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew that there were valiant men. Then the men came, of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people of the servants of David fell and Uriah the Hittite died also. This tells us at, that after a period of mourning, David sends for Bathsheba and makes her his wife. This whole time, David is hiding under a mask of innocence. No one can hide behind a mask with God. 2 Samuel 11:27 says, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. 2 Samuel 12 tells us of the Lord sending Nathan to David. If you will, please flip over to 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The man, rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank up from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been too little, I would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. While David was concerned with not looking bad before his kingdom, he should have been more concerned about not looking bad before God. He wore a mask, yet David and his sins were unmasked. This story shows, shows us that the only ones that we should be concerned about in regards to our personal appearance is God. Ananias and Sapphira are another great example in the Bible of a couple that wore a mask. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Acts, chapter 5. Starting in verse 1 of Acts, chapter 5, it reads, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great was the fear upon all those who had heard of these things. Many may wonder, was it wrong for them to keep back part of the money? And the answer to that is no. The Bible does not tell us it is a sin to be rich. However, they lied about it. The Bible does not tell us that, however, they did have on a mask. They lied to hide their greed behind a mask of generosity. But you can't hide what's in your heart from God. Proverbs 5.13 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Without a doubt, the best example of masks of hypocrisy would be the scribes and the Pharisees. If you turn please, with me, please, please go to the book of John, chapter 8. Starting in verse 2. We see that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and starting in verse 2, it reads, now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had, 
set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be put to death. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he had not heard. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who was without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. From this we can see that these scribes and these Pharisees had on masks, depicting themselves as holy people, only concerned with following the laws and commandments of God. However, they had on masks. They were trying to find a way, any way, to cause Jesus to stumble and disprove who he claimed to be. They were hypocritical. Fueled by flaming arrogance, the scribes and Pharisees did everything in their power to prove that Jesus was a fraud, yet they never could. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 23. Starting in verse 13, it reads, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. We see here that the scribes and the Pharisees, with their two-faced hypocritical nature, kept themselves out of heaven, but still even sadder, their actions resulted in others stumbling in their walk toward heaven. In regards to the analogy that I spoke about previously of the mask, Matthew 23, 27 sums it up best. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. This really sums it up best. It explains how on the outside, the scribes and the Pharisees appeared just and good, and yet on the inside, they were vile and profane. Whenever we do anything, whether it be spiritual or any other facet of our life, we must always check to make sure that our hearts are in the right place. Do we do good things for God or for the praises of men. Take the scribes and Pharisees. They got exactly what they wanted. For a short time, they were praised by men. And yet, I can say with some certainty, their efforts didn't make much of a profoundly good impact on their eternal souls. Because of their hatred and hypocrisy, on the day of judgment, they will have to stand before our Lord and give an account of why they condemned our Savior to death on the cross. Whatever we do, we must always strive to accomplish it in an honest way, without deceit or hypocrisy. To anyone here who may have on a spiritual mask, I beseech you, take off the mask. Live your life as an honest Christian, nothing more and nothing less. It will greatly help you in your walk towards heaven, and it will greatly help others as well. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Scott. Excellent job. We will sing number 566 before our next prayer. 566. Sing verses 1 and 2 and then verse 1 again. Alleluia.
us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this hour of worship that you so much bless us with. We thank you for all those who have come out tonight and their willingness to hear the gospel. We thank you for Scott and his ability to preach the gospel. And you, we pray that you would be with Tate tonight as he, and we pray that you would help him do a good job. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. And we pray that you would lead our minds to this hour of worship. It's in your son's most holy name we pray. Amen. Before I forget, if you would please mark number eight as the invitation song, number eight. Sing that at the conclusion of Tate's lesson this evening. Tate Williams is our next speaker and is another of our fine young men here at Bremen. Tate has distinguished himself among those of his age and has worked very hard at the skill that is involved in preparing and delivering sermons and does an excellent job doing that. We're certainly thankful to have the opportunity to hear him uh, and Scott this evening. Having these and some others uh, among our youth in, in the Bible classes, it challenges those of us who teach them. Uh, and that is a good thing. And we are certainly thankful for the youth here and, and all of these young people here this evening. But let's listen attentively now to Tate Williams. Good evening. It certainly is great to be here tonight. I, too, would like to take this time to thank the elders, as well as each and every one of you for being here tonight. I certainly am glad to see all of you here. Scott, you did a great job. That was a great lesson. I always enjoy getting to hear you preach. You do a wonderful job. Scott just got done mentioning in his lesson David and Bathsheba. David messed up, and he messed up in a big way. His mistake would be as Joseph would choose to call it, and I believe I will as well, a great wickedness and a sin against God. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. I'm here to talk to you about the little thing that he did after this, after he had sinned, after he was uncovered by Nathan the prophet, he prayed. Actually, I'd like to take a quick look at that prayer. Turn your Bibles to Psalms chapter 51. Psalms chapter 51, begin reading in verse 1. Don't want to spend a lot of time on this verse. I do just want to take a quick look at it. Psalms chapter 51, beginning in verse 1. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, and thee only, have I sinned, and done that which is evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou wilt make me to know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. David knew he had sinned. And the only thing that he knew that he could do was pray. Upon reading the account of David and Bathsheba and reading his prayer in Psalms chapter 51, I believe that the conclusion that each and every one of us can come to tonight is that it is no more possible to be a true servant of God without prayer than it is to be alive without breathing. And if that is the case, brethren, then let's spend the remainder of our time this evening studying prayer. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Begin reading in verse 1. Luke 11 and verse 1. <clears throat> And it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place that when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, even as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. 
Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone that is indebted to us, and bring us not into temptation. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to thee. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give to him, because he is a friend, yet because of his importunity he will arise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And of which of you that is a father shall his son ask a loaf, and he give him a stone, or a fish, and he for a fish give him a serpent. We look at the first verse of this text, we see that Jesus was praying. And the more you begin to read and study the life of Christ, the more you begin to realize that this is something that he did quite often. You could even say that prayer played a very significant part in the life of our Savior. And we think back to all the times throughout the gospel, all the times during the days, the different places and situations we find our Lord in when we see him praying, like Paul's admonition to the brethren at Thessalonica, pray without ceasing, we see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ doing just that. We see him praying before daylight in Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 38. We see him praying late at night in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, as well as the night before he chose his 12 apostles, also in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. When John was executed in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 13. And there are a few more I want to look at, but I'll have his turn to those in our Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, when you get there, look at verse 36. We'll start reading there. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here, while I go yonder and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and sore troubled. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Abide ye here, and watch with me. And he went forward a little, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto his disciples, and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying again the same words. Then cometh he to the disciples, and saith to them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that betrayeth me. Shortly before his death, we see him pouring out his soul unto the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. Also, look at Luke chapter 23. Just one more verse, Luke chapter 23, and we'll look at verses... 33 and 34. Luke 23, 33 and 34. And when they came unto the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And parting his garments among them, they cast their lots. As he was hanging on the cross, suffering in pain and agony, he prayed. And he prayed for others. Prayer played such a significant part in the life of our Savior that it caused the apostles to long for him to teach them to pray. And he did. But Christians, not to the apostles alone, but brethren, to us as well. But however, you might ask, can we truly develop this kind of quality? Can we really learn how to pray. Of course we can. We must in order to stay strong through the trials and temptations of life. And brethren, there will be trials and temptations in this life. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, 
Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So Christians, for the brief moments we have remaining this evening, let us learn together from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, how we as Christians ought to pray. Christ teaches us several things about prayer. One, he teaches us of the spiritual relationship we have with God. Christians, God is our Father. He is an all-knowing, all-powerful, loving, merciful Father. And Christ instructs us to recognize our Father God's nature. When he says, hallowed be thy name, Christians, he is holy. And we must remember that as we pray to him, we are speaking to a holy and a glorious God, which means that prayer should be a time of respect and reverence, meaning we should put a great deal of thought and consideration into the things we say in our prayers. You know, are our prayers just the same old prayer, never changing? Do we often speed through our prayers, maybe when we have a nice hot meal on the table, waiting for us just as soon as we can hurry up and say amen? Brethren, let us not forget, Mama might have put that meal there. She might have made it, but she didn't allow for us to eat it. She didn't allow for us to be able to come together and enjoy a nice hot meal. God did. Meaning, we should put our stomachs aside and wholeheartedly thank God for the meal that he has blessed us with. And what about before we lay our heads to sleep at night? Do we have respect enough for our Father in heaven to take just a little bit of time to thank him for the many wonderful blessings that he's given to us in that day? Brethren, be respectful. Think about what you say. And remember, you're speaking to the creator of the entire universe, the one who created you. The second thing Christ teaches us is that he teaches us to focus on the plan of God. Christ teaches us to be concerned in our lives for the will of God. You know, what does God expect from us in our lives? I don't believe I've written a lesson where at some point or another I haven't mentioned a few of the things that God expects from us. Things such as letting your light shine. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 which says, Let your light so shine before men that others may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven to love one another. John 15 12, This new commandment that I give unto you that you love one another even as I have loved you to study and teach the word of God, 2 Timothy 2, 15, study to show thyself approved, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Christians, we are to pray that these things will be done in our lives, that the effort we put forth through doing these things will be fruitful, and that great things will come from them. But it's one thing to bow our heads and to ask for it. Brother, this another thing to be determined and willing to see to it that we actually put forth the effort and try to do these things. And if you ask for it, God will give you the strength and the knowledge and the courage to do those things that he's commanded. But here's the thing, he's not going to make you do it. You have to pray with a willingness to do those things that you pray for. You know, Jesus said, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you for everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth and to everyone that knocketh it shall be opened. But then James said, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss. Christians, we have to be willing to use those things we pray for to glorify God by using them to do the things that he's commanded us to do. The third he reminds us of our moral responsibility to resist temptation. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lusts. Christ teaches us to seek out and pray for God's help. And for us as Christians, and especially those of us who are teenagers, the world has laid down some pretty heavy temptations. It's everywhere. The world has gotten to where we can feel as if there's nowhere we can go, that there's nothing we can do to escape the trials and temptations of this life. But Christians, Christ shows us the way out. He shows us the only way to escape, the only way to overcome, and that is through God. And how fortunate we are as Christians to have this outlet of prayer so that we can go to God and escape the trials and temptations of this world. Finally, Christ teaches us that God is the only one who can save us. Christ said that our Lord and our God is the only one who can deliver us from the evil one. 
John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It is because that God loved and loves each and every one of us so much that he sent his Son to die for us. That we can escape the eternal punishment that each and every one of us rightly deserve. It is through the blood of his Son, Jesus Christ, that we have a hope of eternal life. Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 4 says, Or are ye ignorant that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. Christ teaches us to be thankful for what was done for us. And Christians, may we be thankful each and every day for his son that he sent to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. And Christians, among these things, we need to pray fervently. We need to pray persistently. We need to pray frequently for the lost people we know, for our missionaries, for our elders, for our preachers. And as Jesus teaches us how to pray, he also indicates to us why we should pray. God, our creator and our redeemer, is not a reluctant hearer, but a willing listener, inviting us to receive his blessings as we offer up our petitions and thanksgivings to our Father in heaven through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Prayer is not something that we should take lightly. It should be something we do when we rise in the morning before we lay our heads to sleep at night. It should be something we do every opportunity we get. Prayer is the key to the morning and the bolt of the evening. Psalms chapter 55, verses 16 through 17 says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord will hear me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he will hear my voice. Perhaps there are some of you here tonight who are not yet Christians, but you have the desire to become one. You have heard the word of God. You believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came to this earth to die on the cross for your sins. You are willing to repent of your sins, turn to live a new life entirely devoted to Christ, and you are willing to confess your belief in Christ Jesus before others, and you are willing and you are ready to be baptized in the water gave of baptism for the remission of your sins, to rise to live a new life faithful unto death so that you can receive a crown of life in heaven one day. Or perhaps tonight you are a Christian and you're facing struggles in your life, or perhaps there are things in your life that you know don't belong in the life of that of a Christian, and you ask prayers on your behalf. Or tonight, if you have any need, any need at all, please come, let those needs be known, while together we stand and as we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the
want to say what everybody's thinking. Wow. I know we have one other elder in the audience tonight, but perhaps there are some others. I know there are former elders, but from the elder's perspective, the church is alive and well, and it has a bright future. And I'm proud to say that, and I'm sure he, I'm hopeful I can get some amens on that. We welcome each one of you here tonight, especially those that are visiting with us. We know you're here for a certain event, but if you want to come back, we'll certainly be welcome to have you. I'll remind you of those that were on our prayer list this morning. You're asked to continue to remember Rebecca Wheeler, Jane Dedman, Marilyn Intrican, Jan and Joyce's mother, who's now at home doing much better, Georgie McBride, who is uh, hopefully much better after her recent automobile accident, Brother Roger Lane has uh, back surgery scheduled for August the 10th, and he does request the prayer of the church. My mother's husband, Tom Howard, suffered a mini stroke, continues at the hospital in Douglasville. You're asked to remember also Addie Hunt, who recently had a fall but is doing some better. We're also glad to have our sister Kelly Patterson back with us after being gone for at least a month, right? Five weeks? something like that. So she's back and we're glad to have her. Are there any others that we should mention at this time? Concerning after the event, for those that are staying for the Devo, we'll take about a five to seven minute break and while during that break, for those that are staying for the Devo, kind of make your way down to this area of the auditorium that will give others who wish to kind of greet and so forth uh, that opportunity. But uh, we'll take about a five to seven minute break and all those, those that are staying, stay down in this area of the auditorium and then shortly after that, we'll release you to the fellowship hall which is where the event will take place. Pardon? The Devo will be in here and then the meal will be back there. Okay. The Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that did not have the opportunity this morning to observe it. You have that opportunity now. Once we uh, have our final song, if you'll go through this door, second door on the left, there will be someone there waiting to serve you. After our final song, we'll ask Brother Jake Reeves to dismiss us, and then the Devo will commence. Brother John. Number 15, Amazing Grace. We'll sing verses 1 and 6 before our final prayer. We are certainly thankful for everyone who came to be with us this evening. And... We invite you back anytime you can be here. It was a pleasure to lead the singing this evening as well. We'll stand for our final song, verses 1 and 6. Amazing grace, sweet <coughs> Let us pray. Thank you, God, for Scott and Tate's amazing ability to preach and teach your word. And please help us to take what they have said and what we are about to learn in the upcoming Devo and apply it to our daily lives. And please help us to take it out into the world so we can teach others and maybe influence our nation's leaders so they'll do the right thing in your sight. Thank you, God, for all those who have helped and prepared this Devo for us youth, for us kids. Thank you, God, for all those that help and prepare for Camp Nagehi. In Jesus' name we all pray, amen.